morning. Maybe you're walking in here, as we talked about just a few mo moments ago. Maybe you're not quite in the swing of Christmas yet. Or, or, or maybe Christmas just kind of seems like last year's Christmas, or, or the year before that's Christmas. Or, or, or maybe you're just kind of going through the motions, and, and, and Christmas, it's happening in the shopping centers, it's happening at the mall, it's happening at all the sales, and it's happening on Amazon, and it's happening all over the place. But I wonder if for you and I, if it's really happening right here. Or if it's really happening right here. I wonder if Christmas is real for us, or if it's just been plastic for us this year. To kind of draw us closer into this, take a look at this video as we dig into Plastic Christmas. I'm Ryan, and I love Christmas. To me, Christmas is about, well, it's about the birth of Christ. December can be so busy and stressful, it's nice to end the month with a special day. Sure, we do the Santa stuff. It's fun, our kids love it, but it's not all we do. We find time to tell others about our Lord, what he did, what his sacrifice cost. The night before Christmas, we read the story of the birth of Jesus. When my kids go to bed, they're thinking about how good he is. Christmas Day is so amazing. I can barely wait for it to get here. I love giving presents and I really love spending time with my extended family. At some point during the day, it's good to slow down and remember who Christ is. And you know, I hope this Christmas, I can just take time to reflect. Either way, I know what this day is really about because my Christmas is real. Hey, grab, grab your Bible, open up to uh, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, this is where we were last week. Uh, we're going to continue on in Matthew chapter 1 today and, and really dig into this idea of plastic Christmas a little bit farther. Matthew chapter 1 is the first of the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's about that far into your Bible. Uh, you can grab one on your table, open up. We're going to be there and also in the book of Isaiah in just a, a few minutes. Um, but Matthew chapter 1 is where we're going to be, beginning in verse 18. And, and maybe this story is very familiar. Maybe you've heard these words a lot. In fact, we read them just a moment ago. But to kind of just set the context for us, I want you to think about this. In these verses, Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, what is really the situation around the birth of Jesus? Is it really quiet and quaint? Or is there a lot of controversy, conflict, and chaos? Listen to this in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. That sounds like controversy to me. If you're, if you're Joseph, it sounds like controversy, isn't it? Look at verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Some more controversy. Verse 20, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. More on that in just a minute. You remember back to second grade, maybe it was first grade for you, but and some of you teachers in the room they just have a huge appreciation 
for you because we have so much to learn from you teachers. Amazing teachers. I mean, I remember back in second grade, maybe the second grade classroom, maybe it was first grade classroom. I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a more chaotic environment in the world than the first or second grade classroom as everybody's coming back from recess or, or they're getting ready to go to recess or, or maybe even the day, the last day before Christmas break. You know, and everybody's just, they all know this is the last day of school before Christmas. We're going to go home, and then we get to open presents. We get to go shopping, and, and maybe you even had, like, like Christmas parties, and people brought in cookies and stuff, and, and you got to give gifts to other people. You did the little secret Santa thing. That was chaotic, wasn't it? I mean, you just think about it. It's like a war zone in there sometimes. And yet it never ceased to amaze me how easy it was for the teacher to get everybody's attention. And usually, it wasn't because the teacher would shout over the top of everybody, but usually, the teacher would have some amazing skill to harness all of this chaos and conflict, this war zone of a classroom, by just simply starting to talk very softly. And they just start talking like this, and eventually, someone near the teacher starts to hear that she's trying to say something, or He's trying to let the class know something, and so they start to get quiet, and they start to shush their friends, and soon it ripples through the whole room, and everybody has finally quieted down and realized there's something important to hear from our teacher. Or maybe they do the silent finger count. Do you remember the finger count? Do you ever have this done where if it was really loud and chaotic in the classroom, the teacher would raise their hand and they'd start counting, but they count quietly. They wouldn't say anything, and they go, and by the time they got to three, you knew that... You couldn't be talking anymore, right? Amazingly, sometimes in the middle of all of that chaos in the classroom, the most calming thing, the thing that brings grace and peace and quietness to the room is someone not shouting over the top of everybody, but this incredibly small, quiet presence of leadership in the middle of that. See, in Matthew chapter 1, we see the birth of Jesus. Jesus coming into an incredibly controversial, chaotic, and full of conflict type, of, type of, of lifestyle in Mary and Joseph. Joseph, being a righteous man, finds out that Mary's pregnant, knowing that they haven't been together. There's no way that this could be his child, so clearly the right thing to do is to divorce her and send her on her way. Lots of controversy. There's conflict. Can you imagine some of the conversations between Joseph and Mary? <laughs> yeah, okay, Mary. Heard that one before, right? I mean, can you just imagine the conversations? There's, here's this couple soon to be married, and they're having this kind of conversation about how Mary got pregnant. I mean, I'm guessing it's not so peaceful, and yet it's amazing to me that a king like Jesus who deserves to come in, in, in all of his glory and honor, with all the spotlight on him and trumpets announcing his arrival in the middle of a, of a palace on the highest hill, maybe in, in, in Jerusalem, where everybody could see for miles around it, it, so that he could rule over his kingdom instead of Jesus coming in that way. Jesus comes in the form of a baby in the middle of controversy and chaos. Conflict some marital problems. The amazing thing about Jesus is that he comes in a way that he steps into our mess and doesn't try to avoid our mess. This is why God tells Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 7, we're going to see in just a moment, but then also tells Joseph and Mary, you will call him Jesus he will be named Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning God with us. It comes from the Hebrew language, as we'll see in Isaiah in just a moment. The Hebrew language, El being God, Emmanuel being with us, God with us. It's amazing that Jesus wants to be known as your God, the true God, who wants to not just be apart from you and judging you and standing high up on his throne to point fingers at you, to bring religion and law and, and all this judgment down upon you, but instead he is a God who comes and shows up in the middle of conflict, chaos, and controversy. He is God with us. He is Emmanuel. He is in it with us. 
And we don't just see that here in Matthew chapter 1, but instead we see it all throughout Scripture. In fact, go with me to the book of Isaiah right now. Let's take a look at where the name Emmanuel first pops up in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah is one of the, the prophets. He was sent by God to be a messenger to the people, God's people. Isaiah chapter 7 is where we're at. Turn in your Bibles there. You can pull it on your phone, on an app, if it's easier to find it on the app. Um, Isaiah chapter 7 is where we're going to be. And here's what's amazing, is that 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah was telling the people, you're going to have a Messiah. In fact, his name will be Emmanuel, as we'll see in verse 14 in just a minute. But what's even more amazing is the timing at which Isaiah brings this message of God to the people to bring them comfort, to re-emphasize just how important it is for us to have a God who isn't just off in the distance, but a God who is in the trenches. He is God with us, Emmanuel. This timing is incredible. Uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 7, we're going to see in just a moment that there's lots of controversy, chaos, and even more so conflict here than we can imagine. In fact, if, if you remember back even farther, earlier before this is happening in Isaiah chapter 7, we see God's people being led by King David, and after King David comes King Solomon. But after King Solomon is, is dead and gone, his son, Rehoboam, is, is supposed to come into power and rule over all of Israel. And at that time, all of the tribes of Israel, all 12 of them, were all together in one kingdom. But when Rehoboam was supposed to come up and step into line, be the new king, ten of the tribes said, we don't want him as our king. So there's lots of conflict. In fact, the nation of Israel separated, and now it was separated into two kingdoms. In fact, we have a map to show you of what this looks like. If we can put that up on the screen. This map of the Middle East here, you see this green area, Israel, that's the northern kingdom. That's where the ten tribes went. These are the folks who, who said, we don't want Rehoboam as our king. We don't want Solomon's son as our king. So we're going to set up our own kingdom here in Israel, the northern kingdom. But then the two tribes that went from there, Judah and Benjamin, created their own kingdom in the south, the southern kingdom. Okay, In this, we find that there's lots of conflict. In fact, it gets so bad to the point where the northern kingdom begins thinking it's going to be a really good idea for us to take over the southern kingdom. Even though we were once one people, we should take them over. They are our enemy. So they start to come after the northern, or I'm sorry, the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin. And they're coming after, in fact, they even bring along some of their allies. And they bring along this yellow region up here, Aram. And that's where we pick up the story in Isaiah chapter 7. Is now we have the northern kingdom, Israel those ten tribes, teaming up with Aram and coming after Jerusalem, coming after the southern kingdom, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And that's where we find ourselves in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah comes to the king of the southern kingdom and he brings comforting words to him in chapter 7. In fact, we see here that the king in chapter 7, the king of Judah, the king of the southern kingdom, his name is Ahaz. You can see it there in chapter, in chapter 7, verse 1. Read along here as we just kind of skim through here. It's kind of a little bit confusing. A lot of names that might be hard to, to, to pronounce, but that's the backdrop. And now we find the king of the southern kingdom, Ahaz, in the middle of the crosshairs, because his kingdom is now under attack from the northern kingdom, Israel, and their ally, Aram. Okay? You see the amount of conflict that's going on here? Lots of conflict. Skip down to verse number 10. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Again, Ahaz is the king of the southern kingdom. He's the king that is loyal to God and is now under attack from the northern kingdom in Aram. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz in verse 10. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz says, I, I will not ask him. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. 
Now it's interesting that that language is used right there because as we read from Matthew chapter 1 last week, you remember that the, the lineage of Jesus comes through the house of David, doesn't it? So here, Isaiah's talking to the king of the southern kingdom. He's telling him, this is your lineage. Jesus is coming through your lineage. You are the house of David. He's addressing the southern kingdom, King Ahaz, as the house of David. You're in the lineage. He says, is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? And then here comes verse 14. Like something out of nowhere, out of left field, Isaiah gives him a promise. This incredible promise of a Messiah that will come. It's the first time that we see the name Emmanuel. And look at what he says in verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is Isaiah speaking on behalf of God. He's God's messenger to the southern kingdom, to Ahaz here. He says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give, him, will give birth to a son. And you will call him Emmanuel. God with us. Here's what I find so amazing about this. In fact, you could, you could see it pop up again in chapter 8. Isaiah brings back up the name Emmanuel. Again and again, he's using the name Emmanuel as if he's trying to communicate to them. In fact, if you were Hebrew, if you heard these words spoken to you in Hebrew, you wouldn't hear necessarily a name Emmanuel. You would hear the words, God with us. You wouldn't hear somebody saying, and you will call him this name. You would hear Isaiah saying to you, as people of the southern kingdom of, of, of Judah and Benjamin, you would hear Isaiah saying to you, you will have a king who is coming, and he will be called God with us. Not just a name, but you would hear the action of God wanting to be among you as a people. And I wonder if there's a more desperate time in the life of Ahaz, this king, to hear this kind of message from Isaiah than right here, right now. As he's being attacked by some of his former family members, fellow people that were part of his kingdom, the northern kingdom, these ten tribes, they're coming to attack him bringing their allies along, is there a time that you need God to be among you more than when you're being attacked like that? And so Isaiah brings this promise of not just a God who's watching history unfold, but a God who is stepping in and being with you through the chaos, the controversy, and the conflict. See, if we really believe in a plastic Christmas, if we really just want a plastic Christmas, then the tendency we will have is to simply cover up all the chaos, conflict, and controversy. All the mess. And I guarantee you, the more that you, 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 you try to hide that, the more you try to keep it from other people, the more you put barriers around it, the more you protect that, the farther and farther and farther away you will be from being able to see the real Christmas. Or even, the farther and farther you will be from seeing the need for a Savior. Because if you can just kind of pile it all in a closet, all that mess, all that conflict, the chaos, the controversy, the, the, the hardship in your marriage, the, the, the problems you're having with raising your kids, the addictions that you have in your lives, if you can just keep shoveling it into a closet or putting barriers around it, then you don't need a God to be with you. You just need to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and just keep throwing it in the closet, keep burying it deeper, keep trying to forget about it. Am I right? I mean, haven't you been there? I feel like I'm there on a regular basis where I'm just telling myself, come on, Dave, you gotta pick yourself up. Come on, you gotta just get over that. You just gotta just forget about that or just, just bury it a little bit deeper. 
And yet when we look at Jesus, the very essence, the, the incarnation, God moving into our neighborhood, living among us, being God with us, the, the way that he does that is in a way that doesn't just try to avoid your mess, but wants to deal with it head on. Wants to take all of your chaos, controversy, and conflict and bring resolution, bring grace, bring restoration, bring redemption into the middle of it. And so if you look at any of these moments in history, in Isaiah chapter 7, where, where Isaiah brings this message to these people who are in the middle of this massive war conflict and says, God is with you, Emmanuel. If you look at Jesus being born in the middle of this controversy and chaos with Mary and Joseph and even the world around them, you see God is with us, Emmanuel. If you read in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 28, it says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. Exodus 33, it says, And he said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Deuteronomy chapter 4, the people are being reminded, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God? Whenever we call on him. In Leviticus chapter 26, it says, Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. In Revelation chapter 21, the last chapter of the Bible, John who's writing this book, he says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. If there is a quiet teacher in the classroom raising her fingers in the middle of all the chaos if there, if there is a voice from God today, if there is any kind of message coming from His Word today that is in the middle of all of this chaos or middle of your chaos or conflict or controversy, if there's any kind of mess in your life, it's simply resolved, it's simply redeemed and restored by the very quiet promises of God in Scripture that we hear time and time again that reveal the true nature, even the very name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. He will never leave us. He will always be with us. He will make us his people. And so if we fast forward from all of that, from, from Genesis to Leviticus into Matthew and even into Revelation, and now to our day here, I can't help but think that if you're anything like me, the kind of conflict or chaos or controversy that you have in your life or that I have in my life, the kind of mess that you have to deal with, the, the scars that you have in your past that still hurt, that are maybe still open wounds, the kinds of events that you've had to endure in your life or, or, or the hardships that you know are coming down the pipe the battles you've been fighting with people at work or, or in your neighborhood or, or, or even more painfully, the ways that you're just kind of trying to make it through your relationships, through your everyday. I'm just saying, i got to get to the end of the day. That kind of conflict, that hardship, it's not easy to deal with. Unless you have a God who promises to be with you through all of it. Unless you have a kind of a God in Jesus who doesn't try to avoid your mess, but in His very nature wants to become in the middle of that mess and bring restoration to it. You know, to, to kind of make things a little bit lighter and just to kind of have fun with it, can you think of a more chaotic zone other than the classroom than a Starbucks 
on like a Saturday morning near a shopping mall when everybody's in that crazy frenzy of going shopping. Has anybody been to Starbucks in the last couple of weeks or any kind of coffee shop in the last couple of weeks and seen that happen? Yeah, did anybody go Black Friday shopping? Anybody see any fights? Have you seen people kind of get a little grumpy with each other? Or do you see the kind of road rage that's happening when you're trying to go in and out of a shopping center? Have you seen that stuff? I, mean, I, I can tell you from firsthand of, of, of experience, I was a barista while I lived in St. Louis. While I was in seminary. And, and working from the beginning of November to the 1st of January was just absolute chaos. I mean, it was just nuts. We were half a mile from the biggest shopping mall in, in the area around St. Louis, and, and people would come and stop at Starbucks either on their way to shopping or on their way from shopping. And, and so people are, are already just in the zone thinking about what they need to buy and how much they're going to spend and what their budget is and how quickly they need to get home because then they got a Christmas party to go to. And everything that that means is that it's all about them accomplishing their task, right? Let's be honest, sometimes that's us, isn't it? You don't have to raise your hand, I'll raise my hand. Sometimes it's about me. And I've got this, I've got this agenda, I've got to get to that store and get that taken care of and all this. And Lord help me if I don't have some coffee in my system, you know? So I've got to go to Starbucks first and, and get some coffee or something. And, and if it's all about me, then what am I doing to the barista at Starbucks? You ever think about this? Or, or maybe you've worked in that kind of setting, you've worked retail, or, or you've, you've worked in Starbucks or something like that, and you've seen people just kind of treat you like you're garbage. You ever notice that? Or it's just kind of all about them, it's just all, and if we're honest, that's, that's us too. I mean, many times we will do that ourselves, we'll be guilty of that, where we just kind of throw everybody else out the window say, why aren't you driving faster in the left lane? Don't you know it's Christmas season? You know? You ever do that? I mean, we do that all the time. And in all this chaos, all this controversy, sometimes our tendency is to just get short with people. Isn't it? To want to yell at them on the road. Or honk our horns at them. Or yell at them through the drive through window. Or the, the cashier at... at the department store, to just kind of give them this disgruntled, are you done yet, kind of look, you know? I just can't help but think, if that's me, if I've got to deal with that chaos, or that conflict, or any of that mess, what is it that I'm just most, most desperately longing for? I'm longing for somebody to come in in a very humble, quiet way, maybe like that classroom teacher, but probably more like the way Jesus shows up in Joseph and Mary's life, in a very quiet and humble way to bring grace, to bring gentleness, to bring forgiveness. When we'd have our regular customers come through in Starbucks, they'd give us gifts and they'd bring cookies in for, for the baristas. And we loved, we loved them so much because they knew the kind of chaos we were dealing with. And we, they knew that the orders were stacking up and ten cups lined up, all to be made and everything. And you know what they would do? And we just appreciate it. And it would totally reset our mentality or our attitude towards the rest of the day. Because they'd come and they'd, they'd bring a tin of cookies or they'd just... They just say, "How are you doing?" And we quickly say, "Oh, we're doing good. We're good." You know. But then they they'd say it again. Oh, really? How are you doing? It'd be that simple, quiet, still voice, wanting to bring a little bit of gentleness, a little bit of quiet, a little bit of stillness into the middle of all this chaos. And I think there's something that each and every one of us need to go home with this morning. It's this very thing. Whatever your mess is, if it's conflict, if it's controversy, if it's some kind of chaos around you, maybe it's small, maybe it's big, maybe it's brief, maybe it's a major season of your life that you're in right now, you need to know that Jesus came to be in the middle of that 
to restore you in that. To not avoid you. To not be on his throne in heaven, pointing down at you, judging you, telling you to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. But instead, he's simply inviting you to hear his small, quiet voice saying, I am Jesus. I am Emmanuel. I'm with you in the middle of all of it, in the middle of all the mess. I'm with you in it.